welcome to this service for Sunday the 16th of August, the 10th Sunday after Trinity. My name is Johnny Blair and I'll be leading us through this service. Reverend Cathy will be speaking to us, Carol Abson will be reading the readings for us and Nick Stewart leading us in our intercessions. If you uh, were following the service last week and struggling, I'm very sorry for that. This week we've gone back to a pre-recorded service, which is what you're watching now, whilst we try again uh, to, to make sure the quality of the service uh, that, uh, that we want to live stream is good enough to publish. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. We say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a moment to pause and call to mind those things for which we want to say sorry to God. So let us confess our sins, in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Collect for today. Lord of heaven and earth, as Jesus taught his disciples to be persistent in prayer, give us patience and courage never to lose hope, but always to bring our prayers before you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We say together the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We now listen as Carol Abson reads for us, and then Reverend Cathy will be speaking to us. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 11 verses 1 to 2 and 29 to 26. I ask then, did God reject his people? 
by no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham, from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too now have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory for ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you. That was beautifully read. As we come to the Lord's word today, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is truth. And we pray that you would speak to us today through your word, by your Holy Spirit, and enlighten our lives. Amen. He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. If one word summed up Romans 8 was grace, then the one word in Romans 11 is mercy. In the hymn, And Can It Be, the climax of God's story with his people in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son, is expressed as immense, free mercy. This mercy is for Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female, and we may add black, brown, beige, orange, yellow, and white-skinned, for all those who went before Jesus and have come since Jesus and are yet to come. Mercy is by definition compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is one, within one's power to punish or harm. So it's God not treating human beings as our deeds and sins deserve, while grace is freely giving what we don't deserve. So mercy not treating us as our sins deserve, grace 
giving us the blessings that we don't deserve as sinful people. So today we come to Romans chapter 11. Uh, Tim Keller says, this chapter is one of the most difficult in scripture to understand. So why didn't I give this to one of the curates? So you may want to read the whole of chapter 11 to understand fully what Paul's thinking is here. In Romans 8 to 10, Paul has developed his thinking around salvation for all people, not just the Jews, God's chosen covenant people. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything has changed. The curtain of the temple has been torn in two from top to bottom. And that means that everybody, regardless of race or ethnicity, can approach God. More than that, can have their sins forgiven and be adopted into God's family. This includes, amazingly, the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Any of those among us today who are not Jews, and that includes me. They were previously excluded from God's blessing. And yet now, with this radical cultural shift in Jesus, they are included. They are like the wild olive branch which has been grafted in to the um, indigenous cultivated olive tree which is the people of Israel, the people of God. And it's only by God's mercy. For no one deserves this gift, the gift of salvation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So now in chapter 11, Paul turns his mind to the Jews. He's already been turning this over in his mind in the last couple of chapters. He wonders, are they not in the same camp as the Gentiles? Have they not also failed to obey God through the law? And so they are sinful and falling short of God's standards. He points out that actually it's not the law that saved people, but being children of Abraham, who was the man of the promise and the covenant, and through him circumcision came by which the Jews were the people of God. But they also have sinned, and like the Gentiles, fall short of the glory of God. And yet, on the other hand, theirs is the inheritance in Abraham, the patriarchs, the covenant, the whole story of God with his people. This is Paul's agony. Will God reject them now? Will he reject them on the grounds that they haven't kept the law? Will he reject them on the grounds that they did not recognize the Messiah, his son, Jesus? Will he reject them on the grounds that the Jews took Jesus to Pontius Pilate and said, crucify him? And Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. Will God reject them on grounds of killing the Messiah? This is agony for Paul because this is his own race. And his prayer for the Jews is that they would also, along with the Gentiles, be saved. So, what are the options? Either God has completely rejected the Jews, or they are included on the basis of the previous covenant and promise, or somewhere in the middle. Some will be saved. Those who recognize Christ as Lord, where, where do we come down on this? Simon Ponsonby says, chapter 11 is Paul's hope and expectation for Israel's salvation. And the key question here at the beginning of chapter 11 is this. I ask then, did God reject his people? Paul's instant answer to that has to be an emphatic no. By no means. But it's a little more complicated than that, and I'm going to take us through what Paul says uh, in verses 1 to 6 particularly, and then address the mystery that he talks about in verses 25 to 26. So Paul firstly argues from his own experience. He says, look at me. I'm a Jew. 
I was very blasphemous and a hardened person. He took me, God took me, and is using me mightily in his work. How can we say that God has given up on the Jews? He says, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people. Secondly, this is the argument of foreknowledge, election, which we touched on at the end of chapter 8. I had a great passage then as well. Um, he says, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. God predestined all people to be saved. God foreknew those who would come to faith in him. So this is more than just foreseeing, uh, knowing what people would choose to do. But God has a destiny for all people, and that included, of course it did, everyone from the Jewish race. And God's call is irrevocable. Once God has made a covenant with his people, it cannot be revoked. In 1 Samuel 12, 22, we read, For the sake of his great name, the Lord, he will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. And in verse 28 of Romans 11, we read, As far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. So those God has foreknown, he, they can't fail to believe. God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Thirdly, there is the remnant argument. When the prophet Elijah has challenged the prophets of Baal and Yahweh has proved that he is the only God, a grumpy Elijah says to God, I am the only one left who honors you. God says to Elijah, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And thirdly, fourthly, he says, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were based on works, it would no longer be grace. So the Jews must also be saved purely by grace. Verses 31 to 32. So they too have become disobedient in order that they may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So, as Tim Keller summarizes, God has chosen a faithful remnant by his sheer grace. Those who believe do so entirely by God's grace. So Paul has given us here four arguments about why the Jews have not written themselves out of God's history. They are still part of the story, but they m depend on grace and mercy just the same as those who are not Jews. Paul then goes on to explain how the Gentiles being included in God's kingdom has helped the Jews to come back to God. He says uh, in verse 11, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So step one, um, the Jews rejected Jesus and, and so the Gentiles have been able to come in. Jesus, in his stories, made himself very unpopular with the Pharisees and tax collectors, sorry, the Pharisees and religious leaders by welcoming tax collectors, prostitutes and Gentiles. And he told parables which show that, that the Gentiles were going to be allowed to come in to um, the kingdom of God. There's the story of the tenants in the vineyard, where the analogy is that God will throw out the people who were supposed to be looking after the vineyard because they hadn't done it properly, and he will give it to other people. And then there's the wedding banquet. Those who have been invited will not be allowed in. And instead, he would fill his feast with those from the highways and byways. That is the Gentiles. That's me and you. So Jesus preached good news just as much to Gentiles and Samaritans as to the Jews. They knew they needed to repent and trust in Jesus. Entry to Jesus' kingdom was not by works, but by grace. 
And Paul himself, who calls himself a religious Pharisee, sought to persecute the Christians, but he knows that he was saved only by grace. And ironically, God calls Paul to be the missionary to the Gentiles. It's just beautiful, isn't it? And Paul spreads the word of God, the amazing good news of, the, of Jesus, all throughout the known world, and writes to the people in Rome, which is what we're reading now. So, step one is to preach to the Gentiles, and when one of them reject the message, the message is preached to the Gent sorry, preach to the Jews first, then when they reject it, they preach to the Gentiles who believe. And then the Jews are aroused to envy because they see the Gentiles believing in God and coming into the kingdom. And so Paul says, maybe by this envy, more of them will be saved. This is Paul's hope for Israel. He envisages Israel's future fullness, a recovery, and the Jews being included in the kingdom of God alongside the Gentiles. So it's a kind of circle of goodness that the, the Jews failed to recognize the Messiah, the Gentiles have therefore been included, and then by envy, the Jews will come in and also be part of God's kingdom. So we are all looking forward to the time when Jesus returns and takes us to be his own. Paul finishes with a caution for the Gentile Christians uh, from the olive tree, and he says, beware, because if God didn't um, hesitate to cut off the indigenous branches that weren't bearing fruit, neither will he fail to cut off those wild olive shoots if they don't bear fruit. So it's not just a question of being saved and that's the end of it. We can just live how we like. No, we want to live to please God. Not because we're saved by works, but because we are full of thankfulness for what God has done for us in showing us mercy so we're not punished, in giving us the gift of eternal life, which is his grace, his forgiveness forever. And that makes a difference to the way that we want to live forever. We all were bound over to disobedience. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone needs God's mercy and God's grace. F.F. F. Bruce says, Mercy comes on all without distinction, rather than all without exception. That means that all of us need to respond to the wonderful gift of God, the grace of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is the most amazing gift. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? What is our response to this amazing truth that all can be saved by what Jesus Christ has done for us? This was always in God's plan. I've loved going through the Bible course this year this summer when we've gone right the way through from Genesis to Revelation and we get a picture of the whole story of God and right in the middle is the cross. Right at the pinnacle and the heart of the history of God and the world is the cross. Nothing compares with that. Salvation for all through the cross. Jesus' death and resurrection changed the course of human history. What can we say in response to this? Well, I think Paul has got it all here in the doxology, which finishes this chapter. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent Jesus, your son, to die for us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace to every single one of us. And we pray that you would help that, us not to keep that to ourselves, but to share it with others. We worship you. Father Almighty, with songs of everlasting praise, take our lives and use us for your glory, we pray. 
Amen. Amen. And I invite you to join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, Nick Stewart leads us in our intercessions. The response to the words, Merciful Father, is hear our prayer. Let us pray. Father, today we pray for things happening very close to us, but are often unseen, unnoticed and unprayed for. The pandemic has made this worse as people are still fearful to go out and about. In the face of this hidden world, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Somewhere near us, at this moment, someone is ill and is struggling to stay alive. Someone is struggling to cope because of their helplessness in watching that person suffer. Someone is struggling to keep their marriage together. Someone is struggling to feed their children and keep a roof over their heads. Let us pray for them in their struggle. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Someone near us, a family, is celebrating a birthday. A couple are enjoying their new baby. A holiday is being planned, even in these difficult times. Someone is preparing to do some DIY. Grandparents are talking via Skype with their grandchildren who live far away. Let us pray for them in their joy and relaxation. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Somewhere near us at this moment, the air is electric with a family argument. A woman with depression is weeping. A young man who is furloughed worries that he might not have a job to go back to. Someone is in despair as they have lost their job due to the COVID crisis. Let us pray for them in their dark places. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Someone near us a nurse is tired out from a long night shift. Someone is wondering when the week stops and the weekend starts since having to work from home. Someone is weary from having to juggle caring for their children whilst working from home. Let us pray for them that they find rest. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Someone near us has no faith in God and is lost. A man with so many troubles wonders where God is in his life. A woman, like the Canaanite woman, has great faith that her plea to God will be heard. Let us pray for them all, that they will know that they can trust in the Lord. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. 
somewhere near us at this moment, and every moment until we are here again next week, actually or virtually, God will be lovingly present in every part of his creation and with every person in it. He will be struggling with us, encouraging us, persuading us, delighting with us and despairing over us. God never gives up because he is inexhaustible. Father, help us to have faith and trust in you, whatever our joys and struggles may be. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Nick. And now we come to the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. In a moment's quiet, quietness, let's think about others we might uh, ordinarily see in church, and bless them with God's peace. Amen. At this point in many of our services, we'd be having an offertory hymn. Thank you to all those who are continuing to give regularly and generously to the life and ministry of St Mary's and St John's. It is really appreciated and is being put, put to very good use. If anybody needs to know more about how to give to the church, then please contact one of the clergy or Nick Stewart or the treasurer um, and we'd be delighted to help you. a prayer that reminds us that everything comes from God and actually we're just stewards of what God gives to us. So we say together, yours Lord is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you and of your own do we give you. We now come to our Eucharistic prayer, and we'll use Eucharistic prayer H. So the Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, the Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross, and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and he gave you thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him, his body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. post-communion prayer. God of our pilgrimage, you have willed that the gate of mercy should stand open for those who trust in you. Look upon us with your favour, that we who follow the path of your will may never wander from the way of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't know that I have uh, any particular notices uh, today. Um, it's August, there's a lot of things that are much quieter in the life of, of the church. Um, we will continue to be having uh, services at nine o'clock at St Mary's. Um, do uh, please book in. At the moment there is space available, so um, if you haven't booked in, you can just turn up, um, set, uh, 10 to 9, 5 to 9 on a Sunday morning and you may, uh, um, if the last two Sundays have been um, anything to go by, you will, uh, there will be space for you to be able to join the service. Uh, it's obviously much safer if you're able to, to book in online and you can do that through Church Suites or uh, through the front page of the website. If there's any problems with that, there's a phone number on the website to call or call one of the clergy and we'll make sure that you are, are booked in. We come to the blessing. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. We go into the world to take our next steps towards deeper faith in Christ, welcome and belonging, and shining God's light. Amen. May you have a great day and a great week. May you know God's presence with you as you live to his glory. Amen. And can it be?